so this is the XSLT3 speed drive. Very important. Which I love technology. Now the remote control worked a minute ago. So the XSLT3 testbed is a project that I have on GitHub for uh, trying out XSLT3 functions um, as a way to get a head start on using XSLT3 and to work out sort of how we're going to do it. Um, it's based on processing the JATS style sheets. I'll talk about what JATS is shortly. The reason for this is to get, as I said, is to get an early start on the patterns and the idioms that we're going to use with XSLT3 because a lot of this XSL iterate um, maps and things are new to us and um, I think if people try it out on a common code base then we can learn from each other and get more done more quickly. Uh, it had also to find the infelicities in the spec and perhaps the implementations. So the timing for this is now because the project started in November of last year and then the XSLT3 became a last call working draft in December. If you're not too familiar with the um, W3C process, towards the end of a spec becoming a, uh, a recommendation as last call candidate recommendation, proposed recommendation, and then recommendation itself. And the people in the XSLT3 committee are going to have to provide better justification for any change that they make. And um, Michael was talking this morning about uh, how, it's hard, how it's hard to make changes towards the end. So the sooner people can find these infelicities, the better off everybody will be. Still not working. So the, the project is based around the JAT style sheet. JAT stands for the Journal Archive, Journal Article Tag Set, which grew out of what was known as the NLM DTDs, which were used for uh, submitting art, journal articles to the National Library of Medicine. As it says there, there's more than two million articles archived there, and um, people such as Nature, the Public Library of Science, which do open access journals, are um, putting their journal articles in JATS or NLM and making it available. So there's sort of, you can help the poor researcher um, as well as help the XSLT uh, effort. Here's some formatted JATS articles. These aren't formatted with the, that's great. The, the JATS style sheets there. Um, done with style sheets that modify or customize the, the JAT style sheets. So they you know, pick JATs because firstly it's simpler than perhaps DocBook or um, TEI, but it's not so simple as to be a toy. And um, it's potentially useful to researchers and archives to have a better rendition of the um, content that they're archiving. And there's existing style sheets, which are currently the ones that are publicly available or in XSLT 1.0, so if you want to just add XSLT 2-isms like as attributes or more use of sequences or XPath if level if expressions, then that's a quick win. The current style sheets are in the public domain. The XSLT 3 versions are in also in the public domain. And it's the explicit goal of the 1.0 style sheets that they're not supporting customizations, etc. So there's a lower overhead on trying to get the appearance right, so it's easy to focus on what, trying things with XSLT3. When I say they're not trying to customize things, this one is um, from, from a project to format journal articles. That's the, the one on the other side is the same article with the, the bog standard styles. It's, it's just a preview re rendition. So the goals of the project would be to try out things with XSLT3 to get a leg up on how to use it, to develop the patterns and the idioms because uh, 
if we all sort of speak the same language in our XSL T3, we can read each other's style sheets better. Uh, a sort of sub goal is to produce a package for processing XHTML tables because that's so common across multiple document types. Things that are explicitly not trying to do is to produce the best JAT style sheet or the best way of using XSLT. This is an experiment in trying different things out. And if the style sheet uses different ways of achieving the same result in different places or in different branches, that's fine. It's to see what works and what doesn't. Um, and it's not even a goal to, be, to handle all the JATs. Uh, as, we f as I find more, I contribute it to the JAT style sheets, but it's not a, not a goal. So at this point, I've been trying out maps and anonymous functions in XSL Iterate. I'm going to talk through some of those shortly. It's not uh, a big bang effort. It's just finding small advances in multiple areas. And to <coughs> borrow the terminology from this morning, I'm not trying to find the meteorite that's going to torpedo any of these specifications. It's just to help them at this point in the process. So the results so far include six tickets in the W3C bugzilla. Um, I wouldn't call them all bugs. I doubt that the XSLT working group would either, but um, to bring things to their attention that didn't make sense in the standard to me at least. Uh, as I said, I've been providing patches to the XSLT 1.0 style sheets to handle things which aren't currently handled because I tend to find that making a test document, I leave off things that uh, they assume are going to be there and things break. Uh, I have managed to find one XSLT processor bug in the process, which I thought was an achievement, but I have to admit there was only a bug in reporting where my bug in my style sheet was, so it was only half an achievement. Um, done things with the oxygen plug-in for JATs along the way as well. So I'm going to talk about two aspects of what I've done so far. One of these is using is comparing how to use XSL attribute set with a map of functions. The toy example that I have is I have two tables. Um, for the sake of the exercise, I want to make the table head text red. I want to make the body blue. And there's this one table that wants to be orange. Uh, the, the way to do that in JATS is a style attribute. This isn't a CSS style attribute. This is a, a JATS style indication that, of what the processing should be. The toy style sheets that I'm using are shown here. There's the orange one, which handles the making the special table orange. There's a red and blue style sheets for making text red and blue. And then there's the core JATS style sheet. If you're not familiar with XSL attribute set, that's been around since XSL T 1.0. It's a way of defining a named set of attribute declarations. And when you use that with XSL, you use attribute sets or attribute set, or use attribute sets. Attribute in your XSLT style sheet, the XSLT processor has to go and evaluate those attribute declarations to, to produce a, a set of attributes to add at that point in, in your result. Oh, now I'm confused. So one thing to note about, about XSL attribute set is that when, you, when the XSLT processor has to evaluate this, it does this in the context at which you use the, X, the use attribute sets uh, attribute. There's lots of attributes coming along here. So it has to process it each time in turn. It's not, you often see this with just static strings, but it's not all that you have to do. This example here would be for every element, it's going to potential. It's going to generate a um, an IED attribute with a different value for each element. So it's evaluated once each turn, which will relate to um, what we need to do with the map of functions. 
So the XSL attribute set, using this on my tails and using only XSL attribute sets for the sake of the exercise, oh, it's easy enough to produce attribute sets for use with, to handle lagging text red and blue, but you can't sort of do a per document, I mean a per element attribute set because you declare it and they all sort of merge and aggregate. If I'd made one to make the background orange on the table, I would have, the way I had the style sheet set up, I would have done it with every um, table. The XSL T3-ism that I'm sort of comparing this with would be a map of functions, because anonymous functions, uh, some, or even function name function references are new with XSL T 3.0. Uh, so I'm passing, well, in the attribute set example, I had attribute sets, and the, the initial jet style sheets had attribute sets corresponding to the specific table element. In this case, I'm passing around a map of functions where the keys in the map are the same element names. So to get a correspondence between the attribute set version and the map of functions version. So in this example, uh, I'm passing around a parameter which declares uh, a map and in this case, the T head key is an anonymous function that makes a, an attribute with the color red. So it has the same effect as the XSL attribute sets that you saw before. The, the difference is that when I did this with the specific combination of style sets that I had, with the import precedence got in the way of um, this handy dandy building up of the um, map of functions so that the, what I had red and I had blue was imported from one, uh, the red-blue style sheet. Because the import precedence, I wasn't getting the, um, the declaration for the function for the head. So in this specific example, I didn't get any red head text, but because I could um, override this map of functions, in, in the orange case, I was able to do a specific template which would use the map of functions, um, which is supported by the, the base style sheet to do per element overrides. Another example that I've been looking at is, oh, hold on, that's my summary. So using XSL attribute set, uh, it's been there since 1.0. It's convenient that you, in each module, you declare your, your named attribute sets and they just sort of aggregate as style sheets import each other or include each other. Um, but because of the, the, the way they just sort of aggregate and join together by name means that it's hard for, um, to get sort of per element processing with just attribute sets. And also you can't, explicitly turn off any attribute in your attribute set. The best you can do is have a context with a, a higher precedence or um, <coughs> is declared uh, last and override it with a default value. Compared to that, the, the map of functions provides a mechanism for uh, having a, a general mechanism for the per element uh, override. But writing and maintaining this map of functions is potentially more work. And the way I've done it so far, it's the import precedence is getting in the way of the conceptual purity of uh, building up this map of functions. And you could sort of postulate that you could reduce all of your table processing into functions that call functions that call functions, but then in the end, so that just sort of starts to resemble the type switch in X query. So the second thing that I've been looking at is <coughs> oh, XHTML tables in the XML 
and the HTML output and inserting empty table cells where there is no table cell in the, in the source. I mean, uh, this isn't an edge receipt example. This is just to try out different things. And um, with a, a table is a natural um, application for using XSL iterate. You iterate over the rows and then over the cells in the table. The source that you saw is pretty much like this. Um, I've added question marks for where potentially there, there should be table cells, but they've been omitted. And the way your web browser works, it won't put anything there. It'll put a blank square, as some people would prefer to see every square looking like there was something there. So XSL Iterate is new with XSLT 3.0. You've heard a bit about it this morning. Uh, the text of the, the uh, last call working draft says that many XSLT users find writing recursive functions to be a difficult skill. And this construct promises to be easier to learn. Um, we'll see how that works. And it should be more amenable to optimization. I can't comment on that one. The different parts of the XSL iterate, uh, it looks pretty much like an XSL for each that you, you would be used to from XSLT1 or XSLT2. It can take parameters, um, the new thing is this on completion, which we'll talk about next. So it's, it's mentioned in the same section in the spec as XSL for each. This on completion that you can put at the bottom of your XSL iterate is something that is evaluated the last time through your your XSL iterate, and it can produce an additional result which uh, you can use for the result of the processing or make decisions upon. Two things that you can also put in what sort of the last position within your XSL iterate are. XSL break or XSL next iteration. XSL break, if, if it's evaluated, stops the iterations sort of potentially before the whole sequence has been processed. And XSL next iteration continues the iteration, but this allows you to change some of the parameters that, are, that were passed through at the start of the iteration. So that you can modify things as you go. So this, this last expression, it's important for the use with XSL break and XSL iterate. It's, it's, not, it's not just physically last inside the XSL iterate expression itself. This is this tail recursive um, sort of under the covers that Michael was talking about this morning. You can put it in the XSL next iteration or XSL break as the last thing inside a, an if or when otherwise a catch or a try. So it's essentially the last thing that's evaluated before the end of the iteration. So that if you want if you want to change the parameter each time you go through, you'd put your XSL iterate just at the I mean you put your next iteration at the end of your uh, XSL iterate. If potentially you wanted to modify the parameters in, in different ways depending on decisions that you make, you put it inside a when or a um, if. Uh, so XSL iterate is meant to be easier for programmers to use. I use nested XSL iterates and uh, personally I don't find what fills four screens of um, this in one template, easy to, to read than uh, multiple or a recursive uh, template. And the one, the one that I have at present uses an XSL on, on completion to return the map from, from the inner XSL iterate. And um, again, Michael Kaya suggested using, um, sort of breaking up the decision making about the map from the producing of the table or using an accumulator. So I'll be looking at that sometime soon. I, I'm not sure from the description in the 
expect why XSL iterate doesn't have an XSL sort. So in my last few minutes, I can talk about idioms. Part of the purpose of this exercise with the XSL, XSLT3 testbed is to look at sort of what are the idioms that um, we would use, what are the expressions that are going to come up to, that we can use as a shorthand for getting things done. Uh, an idiom from XSLT 1.0 um, would be Munchian grouping, which was invented because XSLT 1.0 doesn't have a, a good grouping mechanism. I, I added that question mark this morning because, again, after Michael said there's a lot of XSLT 1.0 still out there. If you're using a lot of XSLT 1.0, you'd probably recognize this. If you've moved on, you'd have to think about what this whole thing means. Um, in Another idiom that is used a lot in XSLT 2.0 is shortcuts for XSL choose. In XSL 1.0, you have XSL choose. XPath 2.0, XSLT 2.0. You can put your if then else inside a, a, a XPath expression. Or what often happens in um, star sheets these days is you make a sequence constructor and put a predicate at the end just to get the first of those that actually exists. It, it's one of these things where you would have had to look at it the first time you saw it, but now you have it, you just go, oh yeah, you, you understand it implicitly. So the question is, what are going to be the idioms for XSLT 3.0? Uh, my predictions, which I swear I wrote before Arbel's um, talk, was that it's going to be, we're going to settle on some common safe constructs for streaming and um, Presumably, we'll find a way to find a shorthand for using named functions and function references. Uh, this example came from the XQuery talk mailing list just the last month. So, to conclude, the, the time for trying out XSLT three things is now because um, the specs not quite signed, sealed, and delivered. The implementations are still working on it. The approach of using JATs has benefits in multiple areas, not just in XSLT3. So I encourage you to try it yourselves and try out XSLT3. If we, again, the principle is if we use the same common code base, then we can compare and contrast ideas rather than people developing things in isolation. Thank you. So we have space for questions. Yeah, Abel here in the first row. So maybe John go first because he had Mike uh, and then Abel. I'm interested in your um, experience of uh, iterate because I did an awful lot of stuff where I was using recursive templates with lots of state going round. Yeah. And um, by moving to iterate, I managed to keep everything together in the same place. And particularly what was very interesting about it was the use of the, that with tunneled variables, which meant that you could basically... Oh, sorry, the use of what? Tunneled variables, yeah. uh, tunnel parameters, that you could basically keep on uh, effectively pushing on and accumulating, accumulating a big result. And each of the separate different cases that you came across was a different uh, next iteration and moved in and decided whether it was going to change some part of the state. I, f I found it extremely powerful, actually, and much, much more able to encapsulate all the things I wanted together in one place uh, than I had been previously having to use recursive templates. Well, uh, I'll happily admit that my um, use of um, next iteration or, or the thing, the problem I had was that on completion, trying to, because I had, am I off? Speak, speak up, John. I am still here? That's interesting. The, my current issue so far is that, because the way I had on completion inside the inner XSL iterate is that 
I basically had the buffer the result in processing the table row, and then just used the last function to get the map back, and then put the rest of it to the, the result. Um, potentially, an accumulator will solve my problem, as was suggested to me. And uh, I was writing this slide this morning. I thought of another way that I could do it, which would just make things a whole lot simpler. Thank you. And Abel had a question? Well, actually. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. You actually asked a question halfway, near the, near the end of your presentation. You said, why does XSL iterate not have well, an XSL someone, sort someone child? Tell me. <laughs> we, in, well, actually, before I joined the working group, they introduced XSL iterate to support streaming. And in, instead of having a set that you, sorry, a sequence that you can operate on is with Excel for each. Here you go through each item one by one, which is favoriting streaming processing. And were you to have an Excel sort child there, that would not be possible. Yes, you can, you can, you can sort Excel for each, but I, I mean, for a while there I was looking at using an Excel for each just to sort my things and then iterate over the sorted sequence, which would be sort of double handling. Um, if, I, if I think about things as a Perl program, program you can do a four and then you can put a sort around it and it'll just, have to, it'll just sort. I mean, my other programs, I mean, even in an XSL 4H, the, the sorting just sort of happens. I mean, the streaming case also has the spec for XSL iterate says if you're streaming, you can't use last. So there are provisions in XSL iterate that relate to what you can and can't do with streaming. Um, well, precisely because you can't use last, there was the XSL on completion added. Yes. So you can do something on the last iteration. Right. And I think with sorting, I have no idea how XSL break or XSL on completion would have to operate on yeah, what I mean, moment. Yeah. Without looking into it, I can I can suggest that you say that you can't use sort with streaming because yes, cause you can't. Obviously, as you said, it would break. Yeah, uh, would, you wouldn't be able to stream it except in one case. I think you can guys discuss it further during the <laughs> beer. Very nice. So thank you, Tony, again.